Well, good morning, everyone, and as you're settling in, I want to welcome you to the second installment of our Cajun Lectureship this year for my nutrition seminary at Milton. Uh, I'm Adam Dean, Professor of Biblical Studies and Old Testament for Manual, uh, and it's my privilege to introduce this second lecture today. Uh, the Hayden Lectureship is named in honor of Edwin Hayden, minister uh, in the Christian Church, whose daughter Linda is with us today, and we are grateful, and Dan is online, and we uh, again reiterate our appreciation for all that Dan and Linda have done for Emmanuel and Lillian over many years, and for establishing this lectureship in honor of Edwin Hayden. You can read more of his story on the back of the programs, and we, we uh, appreciate them in so many ways, especially today. I also get to introduce again our speaker for this year's lectureship, Dr. Stephen L. McKenzie, uh, an accomplished scholar and teacher who uh, told us last night that he has now been teaching at Rhodes College for 40 years. He's a number that I had to ask him twice if that was correct. Uh, so uh, 40 years, an, an incredible accomplishment uh, of teaching there. Um, since before I was born, slightly, uh, I, 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 um, and our program lists only a sampling of his many publications over the years, especially in historical books and Deuteronomy's history of the of the Old Testament. But most recently, his work on co-authored commentaries on Kings and Jonah, the latter of which we're hearing about this week, um, and of course the. We also have mentioned the fact that many of us have known Dr. McKenzie for years through his involvement in the Middle East Travel Seminar. I got to travel with him and others in 2009 on that trip and have many fond memories uh, from that experience as well. I've been talking to students who have traveled with, with Steve in the Middle East over the years, uh, as I did, and, and reminiscing about many, many fond memories, some of which are better related in other contexts, perhaps. Um, but, but Steve had a, a kind of mystique to students for all those years as one of the, the guides of those experiences. But in many real ways, students related that he and that experience uh, were catalysts for their own trajectory, both in thinking about how to understand scripture more deeply, but also uh, awareness of global perspective and, and modern realities of conflict and politics. So many good things came out of those experiences for so many. Uh, one student even said, and this is an exact quote, that, that Steve was at least 30% responsible for them doing a doctorate in biblical studies and, and continuing that path, which I found to be a strangely specific number. <laughs> good job on that. I know. And the last thing I would say, in appreciation of, of Dr. McKenzie, is that many of his publications have reached broad audiences and served our own educational work at Emmanuel for many years. When I started at Emmanuel, I was handed a textbook that's, that Steve edited, uh, introducing students to different methods of biblical studies to reach its own meaning. We talked about all the hidden work that goes into editing a book like that last night. Uh, I, I assigned still that text and also his book on covenant in the Bible for Old Testament theology students. It's a wonderfully accessible overview. Uh, and, and many more, like his editing work in the encyclopedia of the Bible and the perception, a tremendous new reference that our students are using all the time right now. So we are grateful to have him here. We appreciate his many years of teaching and scholarship and the way that they've enriched the lives of our students in more ways than I can see now. Uh, before Steve comes to give our second lecture on the book of Jonah, uh, one of our students, Jeremy, will give another reading from the book of Jonah to us. Good morning, everyone. As Dr. Bean said, I will be reading from the book of Jonah, chapters 3 through 4. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up! Go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days' walk across. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk. And he cried out, Forty days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed the fast, and everyone great and small, put on sackcloth. 
When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. Then he had a proclamation made in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, no human being or animal, no herd or flock, shall taste anything. They shall not feed, nor shall they drink water. Human beings and animals shall be covered with sackcloth, and they shall cry mightily to God. All shall turn from their evil ways and from the violence that is in their hands. Who knows? God may relent and change his mind. He may turn from his fierce anger so that we do not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. But this was very displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, Oh, Lord, is this not what I said while I was still in my own country? That is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and ready to relent from punishing. And now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? Then Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city. He made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade, waiting to see what would become of the city. The Lord God appointed a bush and made it come up over Jonah to give shade over his head, to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was very happy about the bush. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the bush so that it withered. When the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah, so that he was faint and asked that he might die. He said, It is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the bush? And he said, Yes, angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, You are concerned about the bush for which you did not labor and which you did not grow. It came to be in a night and perished in a night. And should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also many animals? Thank you, Jim. Thank you, for that kind introduction. Um, and thank you all uh, who uh, were involved in the community here in Emmanuel for your uh, hospitality and very gracious uh, during the last couple of days. So last night we talked about um, issues, problems in Jonah, and particularly the question of the book's main message, the main, my main point of the story. And in this lecture I want to focus on uh, the question of method, methodology. How do biblical scholars go about addressing those questions that arise in the study of book? For um, those of you who are students, this is a particularly relevant topic. And it is something that over the last 40, 50 years, has just exploded in, in biblical scholarship. Uh, to give an example, when I was uh, starting out my career, which turned out to be a career in biblical scholarship, so when I was in the MDM program, I was where many of you are, we really uh, needed only to learn about four or five different approaches to different that was not it. There was what was called at the time literary criticism or source criticism, perhaps better known today. That is looking at a text for evidence of different writers, different hands. Um, we learned form criticism, which focuses on genres, the issue of genre, and also the characteristics of a particular genre look for um, the type of text. Uh, we learned tradition history, trying to trace 
the development of a tradition or an idea or a storyline, maybe from its earliest roots uh, as an oral, um, an oral tradition, and then all the way to a composition and writing. Uh, we learned redaction criticism, which focuses on the, the, the written part of that tradition that developed and, and how a text has been edited and um, And then we learned textual criticism, basically focusing on how a text is uh, transmitted by style. And, and so you, you look at different manuscripts, you look at different versions in translation. And you try to get back to the earliest form of that text that you can, that you can get. So that was about it. Just those those five. There were a few other, pardon me, a few other um, uh, methods that were kind of in their infancy. Things like the canonical criticism that Adam mentioned last night, looking at Jonah in the larger context, larger canon. Uh, rhetorical criticism, which, uh, which focuses on the rhetoric in the text, um, and then even comparing them in some versions of that approach to Aristotelian uh, rhetoric. So, so that was about that was about it. So, a handful, maybe two handfuls as well. Okay. Fast forward to 2010. Uh, and the uh, publication that um, Adam mentioned, the Oxford Encyclopedia of Biblical Interpretation, which I was asked to, to uh, edit, to serve as editor in chief for it. And um, I, I had a great board of, uh, of editors, four other people. So they were fabulous. And the first thing we did was to sit down and kind of come up with a list on the spreadsheet of methods that we wanted to include. There were 120 items on that list. So uh, just in that relatively, well, I think that 40 years is a long time, but I think it's a relatively short period of time. Um, there's been this explosion in methods and approaches. So how do we go about uh, using these things when it comes to and obviously, you can't do everything, so this is going to be a sample. But the way I want to, uh, to focus on this sample is by looking at five specific problems or issues in the book of Job, the long standing issues, and talking about the different approaches, different methods um, that shed light on them. And these five really fall into two categories. <clears throat> I should say, too, back to the Oxford Encyclopedia, we had some wonderful articles, uh, a couple of them uh, uh, submitted by uh, Dr. Paul Bauer. So, so uh, he was one of the contributors to that publication. So, the five issues, the five problems we're going to be looking at fall into kind of two categories. The first two are long-standing problems. Um, and the approaches that we'll talk about <coughs> are not really new. The methods are not really new. But the solutions that I'm going to lay, lay uh, forward off, they have never been proposed uh, by anybody else in my knowledge. Um, so it's taken that long to get right. But just the other three, the last three, are, um, are issues where the methods really are, are relatively new um, and, and, and uh, exciting and shed uh, light in ways that have not, uh, have not been considered before. So the first problem we'll talk about, and, and these are mostly in the meeting that Joni did, the first one that we'll talk about is in um, chapter three, uh, the first four verses. And um, I, I won't read the text because she did a great job reading it. Uh, but we can hone in on the issue here. And the issue really is 
in the description of the size of the city of Jerusalem as being three days' walk across. The average person can walk somewhere between 15 and 20 miles a day. So three days' walk across would be 45 to 60 miles. <coughs> or, in terms of modern scale, roughly the size of the greater dallas Fort Worth metroplex. If you've ever driven through there, you know that you get it and then it takes a good hour before you're out of it. By ancient Near Eastern standards, that is an absolutely impossible city size. There's nothing that comes even close to that kind of information. Okay? There have been various attempts, therefore, to try to explain what's meant by it, what it's talking about. Mm -hmm. um, and, and to add to the complication, just, it, it goes beyond just uh, theoretical talk. <coughs> But as a matter of fact, we know where Nineveh was. Some of you have may remember seeing news reports in the past or relatively recently talking about Iraq. And one of the places mentioned is the city of Mosul. That's Nineveh. That's where Nineveh uh, was, basically. So we know where Nineveh was. Um, it's been excavated long ago. You know where the city walls were. Uh, I've never had the opportunity of being there, but um, there doesn't seem to be any dispute about the fact that you can easily walk around the city wall in, uh, in about three hours. In the afternoon. So nowhere anywhere close to being three day walk walk. Alright. So there's the problem. We identify the problem. How do we go about then looking at the uh, solution? Well, there are a couple of suggestions that have been made uh, that are relatively known. One of them is that um, maybe the, the city of Nineveh, the reference to the three day walk across, is not uh, limited exclusively to the city wall. But it's rather uh, the figure of speech for the larger environment, the, the city state of the okay. The problem with that suggestion is that it would be an absolutely um, anomalous, unprecedented uh, use of the word the city in, in terms of the Hebrew Bible and the Hebrew there's no uh, evidence within the Hebrew Bible or within Mesopotamian Syrian literature that the word for city was ever used to include this larger city state, larger thing. Okay. Another problem, another <coughs> issue, another explanation, rather, pardon me, another explanation for the same um, problem has been to suggest that the three days uh, refers not so much to distance, but rather to time uh, in terms of protocol. That is, that it would take that long kind of uh, welcome of foreign dignity. You know, you'd have to have a way to go in and to see the meetings or what they have to do. So whatever, whatever kind of introduction, presentation of um, credentials and so on, so it would take uh, three days before uh, a person was recognized as um, and welcomed into, into the city. Well, I think we can already sort of see a problem with that explanation. Namely, if you look carefully at Jonah, there's no indication that Jonah presents himself as any kind of dignity. Or that he is recognized as any kind of dignity. So in other words, there's no real reason why there would be any kind of need for a three-day process. So I don't think any either one of those explanations work right now. So I think we do better than to back up 
and the focus again on the literary nature of the story of the film. And I reckon, I mentioned last night that um, one of the things we find characteristic in the book is hyperbole, exaggeration. Because we're talking about you know, Dallas Forward, think in terms of the Texas. <laughs> Everything's made in Texas, right? So Jonah's the Texas of the Hebrew Bible. Everything's <laughs> made in Jonah. It's a big fish, it's a big storm, it's a big wind, it's a, uh, you know, it's repeated over and over and over and over again. With the word great, as I mentioned last night, it's great 14 times in the book. Right? And I saw, I would suggest to you that the three days walk across is another instance of this kind of hyperbole. Now, Nineveh, in its heyday, the historical city, um, in its heyday, which is late uh, 8th century BCE, <clears throat> is by ancient near standard, near standard, an enormous city. So much so that the 120,000 residents referred to in the last couple of verses uh, in the book of Jonah uh, is plausible. Now, that's a plausible number, actually. And that, that would be an enormous city by ancient Greece and Spain. Still, nowhere close to three days walk at all. But you can see how, uh, how it could lend itself to that kind of exaggeration or that kind of hyperbole. Right? Um, so there's another dimension, though, to this particular problem here that gives us a handle on how to deal with it um, from a modern academic standpoint. And, and one of the other solutions that I, I didn't mention and, there, and really the one that I would propose is that the reference to Nineveh as three day walk across is in fact an addition. How do we come to that conclusion? Well, a couple of things. First of all, the limit from the translation that the reference to three day walk across is to the enormity of the city of Nineveh um, is within parentheses. Now there, there is, uh, there's no punctuation really um, in Hebrew. Uh, no, no, no punctuation marks like we have in uh, English like we used to. But Hebrew does signal such things syntactically uh, by the nature of the language. And in this case, the, the syntax that's involved, for those of you who are familiar with language, is the use of a subject first clause, or subject first sentence, followed by a verb in what is often called the perfect form or the subject conjugation. Right? And that's exactly what we have here. And that's one of the ways that writers will, will give you background information, but it is also one of the techniques by enemy to uh, insert something into the back, background of the village, right? And there's another piece of evidence here that helps us to get a handle on that. And this piece of evidence is uh, not really very widely recognized. But if you go on to verse 4, Jonah had barely entered the city one day's walk when he cried out, but uh, in his earlier commentary on Jonah in the Anchor Bible, uh, Jack Stassen points out, though he doesn't follow through with it, but he points out that the expression translated here had barely entered. Um, now, what this really means is, <coughs> more literally in Hebrew, it is began to enter. Jonah began to enter the city. But then what Sasson points out is that this uh, expression has the meaning, has the sense of had just begun to enter, or had far 
hardly it or have barely it. Okay? But if you look at that carefully, you, you've got uh, a discrepancy. You've got a little bit of a problem there. How could a whole day walk into the city equal barely entering? You see the problem? Hardly entering. Just beginning to entry. So, so there's some tension there. And Sasson stopped at that point. But I would like to suggest that, in fact, the reference to the one-day walk is also an addition and is part of this hyperbole, you see? And then it goes back to the reference to the city as three days walk across. So if you bracket out those things that are in italic, that I'm suggesting are later editions, then you have a different picture that emerges here. Namely, in the older version of the story, Jonah comes to Nineveh and barely sets foot inside the city gate, and that's where he delivers his order. And that makes all kinds of sense also uh, in terms of the plot of the story, because remember, Jonah doesn't want to be there to begin with. So he's doing the very least that he can do. But it also makes sense culturally, because the city gate in antiquity is the place where you negotiate business um, uh, negotiation, where you carry out legal transactions. Those of you who uh, have traveled um, in the Middle East and have seen the ruins of ancient cities, you may remember that that you go into a city gate and, and, and you, you use the, the, the term gate is a little deceptive. We're not talking about a steamy gate. We're talking about a gateway. And, and these gateways uh, have chambers uh, as you enter. And, and often, they have benches um, around them. And it's in these locations that you have activities taking place. Okay? And, and uh, you may remember in um, the, the early biblical passage that, uh, that that site or, or, or use this image. Um, and Ruth, for instance, Boaz uh, negotiates for Ruth, basically, and the property of them in the gateway uh, of the city of Bethlehem. Or uh, Amos has such famous quote as established justice in the gate. Why? Because that's where uh, legal transactions maybe court decisions are taking place, judgments. Even today, if you go to Jerusalem and you walk in the Damascus gate, there's all kinds of activity, hubbub taking place there, business transactions and, and, and all kinds of other things. So I, I think this makes perfect sense in terms of the context of the story, um, but also in terms of these other considerations. So methodologically, what are we doing? Well, we're using uh, redaction criticism or source criticism. We're seeing some, some places where we have some tension. Okay? And we're trying then to explain why they're there. But we're also using Hebrew, the language, and the syntax methodologically, and we're also using considerations of ancient Eastern culture and of archaeology. So this is a case where there are multiple methods that, that go lie in the background that inform um, this, this, this problem or this approach. Okay? That's number one. And, and um, one of the advantages, I should say, of um, uh, this uh, arrangement, um, where I'm here and you're there, is that uh, we can uh, do this more in terms of um, conversation. So uh, we will have time at the end for questions. That's fine. But if there are points of clarification on this, please feel free to um, interrupt. Okay. <clears throat> Item number two, or problem number two, is the uh, passage immediately following the one we just looked at. This is in uh, Jonah 3, verses 5 through 9. And the problem here 
is that what, what you have uh, uh, in the passage is that uh, this is basically the response of the people of Nineveh and, and animals as well to Jonah's message. Okay? Um, and, and we talked about this briefly last night, just a quick summary. Everybody repents, basically. Right? And then after, you see that in verse 5, and then if you look at the material in italics, in verses 6 and 7 and the first part of 8 on, on this slide, you have the king of Nineveh issuing a proclamation, a decree, that basically says, okay, everybody repent. You know, uh, pay attention to what Jonah has said. Right. What's the problem? Well, the problem is that the king's decree at this point doesn't really make any sense because he's telling them to do what they have already done, what they're already doing. Right? The king issues a decree telling the people to repent, wear sackcloth, etc. But they're already doing that. They've, all, they've already repented. So how do you explain this issue? That's, that, again, that's the problem. We identify it now. Uh, how, how do we approach this? Well, a couple of suggestions that have already been put forward. One, from a historical critical or redaction critical, source critical perspective, is to suggest that the king's decree doesn't really fit and therefore is an addition. Right? But um, sometimes, Mary and I were talking before the lecture, you know, historical criticism has been dominant in the field of biblical studies for so long that a lot of times historical critics have tended to ignore other kinds of explanation. Um, and uh, this is a good case in point because another equally, at least, viable explanation would be if you recognize Jonah as empirical, is to suggest that, the, that this is a portrait of the king that's kind of an idiot. <laughs> you know, that, the, that the king of Nineveh is kind of incompetent, he's pompous, he, he, he issues a decree sort of to take credit for what everybody's already doing, you know, um, and he's behind time, you know, he's, he's like the guy who says, I gotta catch up with him because I'm their leader. So that's that's another explanation from a more literary perspective, and um, both of those are viable options. Uh, I, I would like to suggest that they're not mutually exclusive. Uh, that in fact this could be. A later edition, the King's Decree, um, but a later edition uh, to the older, shorter book of Jonah, or version of the story of Jonah, by this secondary author editor who really turns the work into a work of uh, satire. Okay. And that's what I think is, is uh, going on. Fortunately, there's actually another piece of evidence. Here. And it's a piece of evidence that is uh, pretty much uh, completely overlooked. Um, but it's a, a bit more tangible in some ways. And it is text critical. Uh, and this also is something that Jack Sasson points out, but he doesn't carry through. And what he observes is that if you compare the Hebrew verbs uh, in uh, specifically in uh, verse 8, the Hebrew verb and the Greek verbs uh, in the Greek translation, if you compare them, uh, they're, they are different. The uh, Hebrew verbs here are justice. Joseph is a, a kind of a 
third person command. Uh, let them. Let them um, cover themselves with sackcloth. Let them cry out fervently. Let them be penitent. Justice. <clears throat> the Greek uh, translation in verse 8 has not justice, <coughs> excuse me, or octaves, as we might expect in Greek, but instead has aorists, past tense groups. They did this. They covered themselves. They prayed or fasted. They repented. Yeah. So, what that means in terms of the context of the, of the, of the text is that in the Hebrew text, verse 8 continues the decree of the king, saying they should do this, they need to do this, let them. Whereas the Greek reading in verse 8 picks up from verse 5 as the continuation of the narrative about the people repenting, about what they already have done. So there's a difference there in the way that these two witnesses are reading that verse. And often when that happens in textual criticism, we talked about this a little bit last night, uh, <laughs> In the wake of the, the Dead Sea Scroll discovery, the late 1940s, but it's taken decades for us now to begin to understand the real uh, implications uh, of, of those discoveries of the Dead Sea Scroll. And one of the things that they have made clear is that the line that was traditionally drawn between the composition of a book, the writing of a book, versus the transmission of a book, that scribes, copies, that line is pretty blurry. Uh, there, there's a lot of composition that continues today, and that evidence of that continuing composition, or the evidence of different variants or different textual traditions is often uh, preserved in textual witnesses. Okay? And one of the other things that the Dead Sea Scrolls have shown for a number of books of the Hebrew Bible, Samuel, the Daniel, the Christine, and also the Prophets, is that the Greek translation, the Septuagint, was not done by someone or someone who were just making it up as they went along, but that these were very good and very careful translators who were very liberal in, in their memory. Now that doesn't hold true for all the books in the Hebrew Bible, but it does for me. And what that means is that they may not have been great translators in the sense of rendering it good Greek, but they were great translators in terms of helpfulness to us for understanding what they meant, what the text was that they were uh, translating. Right. So when you have this kind of difference in detail between these two different kinds of verbs, it, it, it can mean something's going on. Something uh, it is, it is, it is up. And I would suggest that what's being preserved here is two different ways of reading the king's decree, and that's because the king's decree probably is an insertion, probably is an addition, again by the secondary author, secondary editor. Right? And we have to bring in another piece of evidence from another method, um, literary or redaction. We have another indication of this. Um, and that is a literary or editorial technique. Um, and I'm going to click on Professor Meredith Shields here. Who um, so I've, so I've just learned, uh, well, I had the pleasure of meeting just a few moments ago. The German library is excellent. So, this is a case of what is called Dieter Alpha. Which means, depending on the 
the spot. It's really nasty to look at Picking up again, yes. Uh, picking up again, um, or, or when the subtitles they might say in better English, uh, or, or, or literary purposes, narrative resumption. So when you, as an editor, take a text and you splice something in, you splice it in at 20 texts, and then when you're finished with your splice and you come to the end, you pick up again where you left off. You somehow reiterate point X. So, <coughs> you can see this here. If you look at verse 5, uh, this is the report of, of the repentance of the people of Nineveh. They believe God called for a fast rest. Because the last thing that's mentioned here is the investing in sackcloth. And that's the greatest of the reasons. Then we put in the king's decree in verses 6 and 7. And then where do you pick up again when you're done with the decree? Look at the first part of verse 8. They cover themselves, let them cover themselves with sackcloth. Picks up in the same place where it left off. You see? Narrative resumption, leader out. It's, it's, uh, again, it's not foolproof. It doesn't prove that there's an editor here. You can often see but it is a technique that is used by uh, editors. And so, methodologically, what do we have going on here? Well, we have, again, um, some, some um, historical critical techniques, redaction criticism and source criticism. But we also have um, textual criticism, uh, understood more broadly than just comparing manuscripts looking at some of the implications of those differences in the um, And we have also uh, you know, literary analysis of, of, this, uh, of this text. OK, that's problem number two. All right? Moving on. Problem three. Another long-standing problem in the book of Jonah. And that is the location of Tarshish. You may remember <coughs> Tarshish is the place where Jonah tried to flee in the, in the very opening of the book. Um, and outside of that opening, it's mentioned one other time in chapter 4, uh, verse 2, where he explained why he tried to run away from Tarshish. Okay. Why is this a problem? Well, it's a problem because um, scholars have located Tarshish in different places. The uh, more traditional, I don't know if. Um, Africa, and that the story preserves um, 
um, or assume the existence of a canal built between the Mediterranean um, and the Red Sea. So we have those um, proposals. Uh, I, I want to suggest that um, the traditional site of, of, of Tartessa in Spain, Spain, has an awful lot going on. And there was an article uh, published in 2012 by a British scholar, very well known British scholar, John Day, who, who uh, went through the evidence and made a pretty compelling case for Carl Castle on the southern coast of Spain. Right? But I also want to use this uh, and, and these considerations as a kind of a jumping off point for considering a different, a newer kind of method uh, in, in uh, I don't want to be given to it, namely the method of spatial analysis. Okay. Spaces and, uh, and the, the function and effects. So let, let me say a little bit, first of all, about our test halls. I think this is, to some degree, a case of Biblical scholars um, missing the forest for the trees. We do that. Um, we get so focused on a point of grammar or something like that that we kind of miss the bigger picture. And it, it, it seems to me that just from the standpoint of the bigger picture, our castle makes all kinds of sense. You know, um, it, it's a bit of an exaggeration. Say that Jonah is told to go east, and Nineveh is sort of northeast, but, but still, uh, if you think of it, Syria, like east of Palestine, Jonah's probably told to go west. If you go east, what does he do? He heads west just as far as he can go, yeah. basically. And, and so, you know, that, that just, just looking at a map, uh, I think, is, is, is always a useful exercise. And in the case of, of Jonah, this is a case where consideration of, of the map and consideration of the narrative just really seem to me to you go know, really well together. Um, if he's going to Parsons, for example, I don't even know why you need to get on a ship. Uh, and, and, and frankly, that's the kind of the way, in, at least in part, that you go from the end of any because you don't go across the desert, you go up over the ground. Um, so, I, I, I just think that Parkesos um, really uh, works well there. But, whatever you may decide about the location of Parkesos, uh, or Parkesos, or Parkesos, I, I want to draw on some other kinds of and that is that in terms of spatial analysis, spatial analysis certainly emphasizes points on that, but it does a lot more. Uh, for one thing, it points out that spaces, location, and biblical text often are more than just points on that, but that they have different functions in terms of quality. What I mean by that is uh, people who are experts in spatial analysis, and I'm not, but people who are, sometimes will talk about first space, second space, third space. So they'll put a categorize. So first space, actual location. Okay. Uh, second space, uh, something along the lines of mental or conceived. Location. And third space, something along the lines of idealized location, the places where you can um, start again or everything is new. So, in the case of Nineveh, Nineveh has a point on the map, so it has its Tarshish, both of them, but, um, but they're both. You know, 
beyond the first stage, there are also second stage, third stage. It might help, for example, to think of uh, the differences between these quality as the way we talk about places like Timbuktu or Kathmandu. They're real locations, but most of us haven't been there. And so we we have the uh, we have a conception of them in our mind. And we may even think of one of them as an exotic um, utopian location, simply a long road. So um, in the case of uh, Tarshish, Jonah, we don't know this, but it doesn't seem like Jonah's ever been there. So it's not just that he wants to go somewhere different. Uh, he conceives of Tarshish as a place where he can get away and start over. And again, um, beyond that, uh, spatial analysis also focuses on movements in, in space, um, in location. So and there's a real irony and a beauty going on here in terms of Nineveh and uh, Tarshish. Right? Uh, Tarshish is west. West is sunset. West is end. West is dying. West is death. And all of the movement in the first two chapters of Jonah toward Tarshish is all downward. Jonah goes down to Java. He goes down to the ship. He goes down into the hold of the ship. He goes down into the sea. And he goes down into the underworld. So, you know, it's all down, down, down. Ironically, uh, Nineveh is east, but east is life. It, 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 Jonah's beds it, Jonah's saved it, but that's the direction he needs to go in order to, um, to, to, to survive, to live. So, so you have the, the, the movement of, 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 of uh, Jonah from location to location, kind of illustrating in some ways a part of the point um, of the story. Um, so another uh, function of movement is, uh, or, or spatial analysis here, is that spatial analysis also shows in Jonah that Jonah doesn't like interiors. He doesn't like being inside the fish, who would? He's not really excited about being inside of Nineveh. He likes much better to be outside uh, of, of, uh, of Nineveh and look on from the outside. And finally, one other consideration of spatial analysis is that the, that the story in Jonah <coughs> leaves out a huge chunk of space. That is, there is not a word in it about Jonah's journey from when he's called again, from the beginning, commissioned again, chapter 3, to when he gets to Nineveh. That's a long way. Uh, and it's a journey that's, that's overland, it is perilous, it is dangerous, nothing at all in the, in the story of Jonah about anything that happened on that journey. So that is also revealing in terms of the literature, in terms of the story, because it shows you that this is not, again, a journalistic report. The writer is not interested in getting everything down and down. The writer is interested in focusing on the parts of the story uh, that the writer uses to make the point, regardless of So spatial analysis, right? Four. There's a fourth problem that we're going to look at. I'm not a text. That's fine. The fourth problem that we're going to look at is um, a problem, um, or it's a kind of an overarching problem, um, and that is uh, focusing on Jonah himself. Jonah's reaction. How do we account for why Jonah behaves the way he does? And the approach here, uh, that is new, uh, and, and can 
be very helpful to this is what's called trauma theory. Okay? Um, it, it goes out of my understanding, and uh, I think Joni is more of an expert than I, but, uh, but she doesn't have a microphone. So, uh, so uh, the, uh, my understanding of trauma theory is that it kind of has two different views um, in terms of biblical studies. That there's a part of it that is, has its roots in sociology, and it tends to focus on a community, and how a community that has been through a traumatic experience uh, uh, hears or experiences a story, a biblical story. I touched on this a little bit last night when we looked at Jewish interpretation of Jonah and, uh, and focusing on mercy versus justice. Right? Um, and so, in, in terms of biblical studies, this one, uh, look at literature in the Hebrew Bible and reflect on how that literature was read by a community that had experienced that God. This is that one we read that. But another branch or root of uh, trauma theory is a, a coach that grew out of healthcare in the 1970s and dealing specifically with was what we now call PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and you know, originally or initially dealing with soldiers returning from warfare who were suffering PTSD, but also the impact of traumatic experiences on the individual and on the activity of the individual. So if you think of Jonah as a traumatized person, it, it allows for a different view of the book. Uh, Jonah has a number of experiences that can certainly be considered from that. Um, first of all, he's compelled against his will to go to Nineveh, a place that he fears. Um, and just showing up in this city, which is the capital of uh, uh, this uh, empire, and then uh, uttering threats against it, that could, you know, set off a little bit of dread. In the world, right? Then he's a passenger on the ship that is assailed by the storm, you see, and he doesn't know whether he's going to survive that, and he maybe even is more traumatized than the sailors because he knows it's his fault, after all. Then he goes from the ship that's rocking into the sea, and he doesn't know whether he's going to survive there or drown. And then he goes into the valley of the fish, and he doesn't know whether he's going to survive that. So it's one trauma after another after another. And then he gets spit up on dry land, and the narrative doesn't tell us how long, but sometime after that, he's told to do it all over again. Go to Nineveh, right? So it's, it's one trauma after another after another. And um, if you start then considering Jonah's activities, I also left off the part in the narrative that, that the story that's unfolded, the, the overland journey from um, Palestine to Nineveh, and he goes that long distance that we know nothing about, also uh, quite likely a traumatic experience. But if you then start looking at the details of the story, um, you can see maybe why some of the things he does uh, would be explained. For example, how is it that he says, um, I serve Yahweh, God of sea and dry land. I believe in Yahweh, and this is my God. And yet, what's he trying to do? Go away. That, 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 that makes no sense. Uh, it, it, it's, a, um, it's an inconsistent. His activities don't match his professed beliefs. 
response for a person undergoing trauma, that's not necessarily an unrealistic response. Uh, there are also, if, if particularly in chapter 4, when Jonah uh, announces, uh, has announced, uh, Nineveh's decline, Nineveh's fall, and then he leaves the city. Um, and somewhere in there, there's some problems there, but somewhere in there, he finds out that God has decided not to destroy the city. But well, how does he react? Not the way a typical prophet would react. Right? He's not, you know, he's not happy. He's angry. And he, and he, he loses it. Yeah. And he lets go of this angry tirade about God being merciful. Um, well, again, maybe not a completely unrealistic reaction on the part of somebody who has gone through trauma after trauma after trauma. And in the conversation in chapter 4, there are places particularly at the end of chapter 4, verse 4, when God asks Jonah questions, is your fear justified, not your fear, is your anger justified? And Jonah doesn't answer. And then the book, you remember, ends on the question that Jonah doesn't answer. But again, silence uh, on the part of somebody who is undergoing trauma is not unrealistic. So, uh, leading Jonah through the lens, through the eyes of a person who has undergone trauma has some advantages. It explains some of these um, inconsistencies in the book that might not be satisfactorily explicable uh, by a historical critical or other means. It also has the great advantage in some ways of allowing us to see Jonah through fresh eyes as a person who is not just or not petulant, selfish, <coughs> disobedient, and stubborn, but rather uh, someone who is in fact wrong. And therefore, it allows us to see Jonah uh, with a little more compassion. Okay? Five. Right. So the fifth film of the fifth issue, and again, uh, something I alluded to last night, um, animals and the environment. And in particular, animal studies. Animals, as we saw last night, have a remarkable uh, place in the book of Jonah. Animals of one kind or another are mentioned in all four chapters. There's the fish in chapter 1 and 2. There's uh, the animals in the city of Nineveh in chapter 3. There are the worm, or there's the worm in chapter 4, and then another reference to the animals of Nineveh, also at the end of chapter 4. So, a few background comments, first of all, about the species. Of three different kinds of animals. Um, and this might prove to be a bit more interesting than you might initially think. So, uh, first of all, in the popular and artistic rendering of the story, the fish is typically called a whale, as you know. We know that whales are not fish for mammals, but I think it's a uh, not quite fair to expect that the ancient writer would know that distinction. Um, so on one level, whale is, uh, is an appropriate um, representation or designation. Uh, but there's more to it than that. In the ideology uh, of this story, or what lies behind this story, the so-called fish probably wasn't a fish. It was a mythological creature, a sea monster, a kraken, if you will. Um, this is certainly the case with the ancient Near Eastern background of 
of the story and, and specifically of the song of Jonah in chapter 2, which I'll talk about uh, this afternoon. But also in Greek literature, in Hellenistic tales, there's a collection of, uh, one of the collections, there are separate Hellenistic seafaring tales. Uh, I was talking to Dave Tiger about that last night. That, um, that uh, lie in the background of the story, and I think, frankly, have influenced the story in chapter one. That's why I would want to make the book to the Hellenistic period. Um, we have several of these, <coughs> just to cite one example, there's a story about the Greek hero of Hercules, or uh, that's the Latin Heracles, um, who goes inside a sea monster and, uh, and kills the sea monster from the inside, and he does so in order to uh, save the princess Hesse, princess of okay. So. So we have stories like that. One, one of the things that those stories, at least some of them, help to explain in Jonah 1 is why Jonah sails to Joppa. Because Joppa makes no sense otherwise, but Joppa is common to those stories, those, those uh, Hellenistic tales in, in the uh, late 4th century, early 3rd century. Right? So, um, this fish in its background was almost certainly a sea monster. And I uh, suggest the last night, and we'll talk about this more this afternoon, but I suggest the last night taking a look at, at the NRSV translation of Matthew 1240. Why? Because you see what the, what the NRSV does is to translate uh, what the Greek says there. And the word that it uses for the, the creature that swallows Jonah is kathos, mm -hmm. the Greek word kathos, um, which, which is used in sort of more recent Greek for whale, but in its older uh, meaning is, is a kraken, a sea monster. And that's what the NRC translates there. When Jesus says, uh, Jonah is swallowed by a sea monster. So how do you get from sea monster well, I don't know for sure, but I suspect that this is that satirical writer who turns the sea monster, the fearful, horrible sea monster, into what? A big fish. Right? Um, so, uh, we have that. Uh, otherwise, why would the writer say that he swallowed that fish as opposed to the dragon? The only hint, now moving on to, to chapter 3, the only hint about the animals that are mentioned there is in chapter 3, verse 7, which refers to humans and animals, and then further, cattle and sheep. Both of those are illustrations of a figure of speech called the narrative, which uses two words to uh, often polar opposite to express uh, a larger group. So in English, we say, I searched high and low, meaning everything. Right? Or we say, um, uh, you know, everyone came rich and poor. Rich and poor, everyone. Uh, or all kinds of people. All right. So humans and animals means sentient beings. Cattle and sheep would refer specifically to Domesticated animals. Sheep, oxen, goats, maybe others. <coughs> not dogs. Dogs were not domesticated. They were wild and they were scattered. They weren't kept in pets. Um, we wouldn't expect to find herds of livestock in Nineveh inside the city. Those would be in pasture. But there would be some that would be used for conveyance. Um, that would be brought into the market, maybe sacrificed, although Assyrian worship didn't really involve animal sacrifice. But the writer, the Israelite writer, was not doing that. At any rate, um, there's no indication of how many 
and more important than vision is here. But that's a little bit of background. Finally, 4 7, the, the, the animal, the insect that eats the plant, is identified in different ways. No consensus about what this is a worm, or maybe a larva, a larva um, or uh, some kind of weevil, or my favorite, maggot. Maggot. So, so the, you know, the, the, the smallest um, uh, kind of animal. Anyway, <laughs> what makes this amazing, particularly when you throw the maggot in, is that all of the animals in Jonah play key roles in the story. Uh, the fish, the worm, I mentioned this last night, <clears throat> are all specially appointed or designated. That word, that verb, occurs four times. By God Himself, God appointed, God designated. And again, I just love that image of the Almighty talking to them. You, I choose you. Uh, okay. <clears throat> um, so, this common terminology, and, and uh, that they have, they are on the same level with Jonah as, as being chosen for a specific task. For a specific task. Um, so that shows, I think, that the animals and the humans are all part of the system. They're all part of, of a larger entity. Um, and this is, then, something that is just in its infancy, pathologically, in the study, uh, and that is animal study. Considering the roles of animals, um, and frankly, considering them often as on the equal footing and the philosophical implications of that. Um, what makes it even more striking than Jonah, of course, is that you have all of these animals and so on. And of all of them, the only one who doesn't follow through is Jonah. Um, all of them, of course, also attest um, God's power over creation. And I might mention that one of those beings that is uh, appointed is also the plant itself. So it's not only animals and so on, it's also vegetation. Uh, the, the, most of all, most of all, the animals of the internet play the most remarkable role in the story because, particularly when you look at End of the book. Again, they put on sackcloth, they repent, they pray, um, they pass you know, in, in the story. And their acts of contrition move Yahweh not to destroy the city. So uh, we talked about this a little bit last night in the question and answer again, but Readers of the Bible have traditionally emphasized Genesis 1 and the idea of human dominion over creation. Maybe it's time to think about Jonah and the idea of a more equal distribution of God's concern. Particularly, and I don't know if you saw this recently, but an astounding report uh, just a few days ago released by the World Wildlife Foundation that on average animal population on the planet um, has decreased, declined 70% over the last, uh, since the 1970s. So, this set of cultures, this set of problems, again, just a sample, but I hope it's uh, given you uh, some interest, deep your interest, uh, and your appreciation of the book of Jonah, but also uh, some interest in the methods used by the scholars to get out some of these. Thank you very much. Some of the 120 diverse methods of analysis or so that 
and brought and studied physical tests these days. Um, we want to welcome all of you to a lunch downstairs in this building. You can make your way down uh, from the back via stairs or elevator, and you are all invited to lunch directly below where you're sitting right now. Please join us downstairs. And uh, to stay on schedule, we're actually going to ask you to hold your questions right now. And uh, you can order Steve during lunch, perhaps, and, and ask your questions then, or return to join us at floor uh, for the final lecture, 4 o'clock in this room again. We'll do the final lecture on Jonah, and we'll have more time for questions. Then. But we don't want to hold everyone hostage when lunch is waiting downstairs right now. So uh, we will chew on the, the, the many good things that, that Dr. McKenzie has given us to, to think about, and then we will join each other for lunch downstairs. Uh, and this time, then, I would like to welcome Spencer, one of our Master of Divinity students, to give a blessing for us before we head down for lunch. And then you can, can dive in. Let's pray. Lord, we praise you and we thank you. In this community that was formed around the shared desire to learn about you, we stand in awe of who you are and who we get to be because of you. In the intricacies of Jonah, we find your beauty, your love, and your presence, and we thank you for that means. As we continue to enjoy and consider the words and the events we have shared, finding them both informative and stimulating, let us enjoy a meal with one another. Bless this meal and bless this, the community let us celebrate our shared learning and honor our shared experience. We love you and we 